Deepak Rajan, how's it going? German Lucky, you got a full full house today. Everyone had Countach on their wall as a kid, right? I don't know what what is the. I didn't have it. What is Countach? This this was the model people had. <laughs> This is like the one that's in um, Puntash. Oh, sorry. This is the uh, this is the one that's in the uh, Wolf of Wall Street. But this is even more advanced. <laughs> yeah. So um, this model is just from the learning scenes. You had the Ferrari. <laughs> it's like you went to Walmart, you had the 12 different posters you could pick from. There was like two different automotive ones, four different wrappers. So like three, three quarterbacks. But yeah, this is um, from the Arnold learning scenes. But I think under, I don't know, this is like a slightly different model or whatever that they had. But if you go to tutorials, um, I don't know which section. I don't know if it's under this section, but somewhere in it, I think they had this lighting. It might be like studio setup, automotive. Umer, how's it going? I'm doing pretty good. So uh, yeah, I think they just, they're switching, they have a few different car models or something like that they use. Um, but yeah, we we'll could talk about some of this stuff, the different, um, for now, changing the, the stuff, I'm probably just gonna do a constant color in the end. Um, but yeah, I think we can get started. I was just doing a test render here and I had the settings turned down quite a bit. Let's we'll go to full. Full resolution, um, back in the camera, and I think what I'm gonna do, um, let's just get it, get this thing going again. <laughs> so I was thinking maybe this before we start with the vehicle. Um, this asphalt stuff, the texture frequency of it just felt a little weird. Um, I feel like it's too, too high frequency of a texture. We want maybe to like stretch it out a little bit more. What do you guys think? It's already making blunders today. <laughs> yeah, I think it was too, um, it was a bit too like compressed uh, yesterday. But I think that was one of the issues we were having with the displacement map and stuff like that. Um, and then I think uh, like I had ended up just sl slamming some values around. With this normal map, I ended up with two, which was looking better with the compressed one, but I think for, like now we can actually see some some little rocks. Uh, this might be a little, we might've gone a, just a little too far, but um, we'll just keep, keep messing around. So I'm just controlling that with the UV project instead of you can do it in Redshift in the shader if you like link up all the uh, texture nodes. Yeah, I think it got a little too big before. Like I think. What do you think about this? It's feeling feeling nice. The lighting is a bit weird, I feel like, right now, but we can uh, test some of that stuff later. The other thing I was going to mention is, like, 
sometimes when you're making the shaders and testing stuff out, um, it can be helpful to have a few different um, lighting things. Like if you do use a dome light, this you know the value that this is going to be. Like it should just be a unit or whatever. Um, so if you just sometimes switch to this or there's a HDRI map you know you're quite comfortable using. Um, there was the um, resources link I put in the chat yesterday that has some of the HDRI stuff that I was using. Um, you might be able to find some similar ones or some of the ones there. I might just do this. Uh, I have some nighttime ones, maybe. See what happens with it. I don't know. Might just do a day. This is just kind of to check values against. There's also like a studio. Let's see what that looks like. So like comparatively, you could see the how the car is reflecting against the terrain uh, and or the the ground and stuff like that in different um, kind of scenarios or whatever. This Etney's Park is usually a pretty good like daytime one. Um, but sometimes they this one I'm not I don't know. It's a bit blue or whatever. Like it's, I guess it's just because of the, the sky, but um, where did it go? Sometimes it's just a hemispherical. That will get rid of some of the bounce stuff or whatever. But yeah, this is just nice. It does like a sanity check. Like if you're starting to light with a like area light that's real close to stuff, it can be burning out and uh, just giving you like some weird settings and stuff like that. So sometimes it's better to do some look dev. Um, some people even do look dev in like a studio scene where they know the temperature, the intensity of all the lights. They'll have the Macbeth color checker, like all the, the, the stuff out. Um, I'm not too... <laughs> I'm not too experienced. Or I'm not the best look dev artist in terms of experience. So just push push through this for with this kind of method right now. And if people object or have have better uh, advice, feel free to let me know. So I think with this vehicle, uh, we were talking a little bit yesterday about going in and separating some of the stuff out. Um, so you can do that using the Alembic paths attribute. So when we brought it in, um, I was talking about that prim path attribute. You do the nine key in the viewport. Um, you should see them. I think you just have to do this gear drop down Alembic paths. So using these names as uh, selection sets, or sometimes you can get information from the name. Like, for example, this headlight glass, you probably know that that wants a glass shader applied to it. Um, so you could do some, like maybe if the windows are, uh, it doesn't have glass in that, but you could just do another filter. Um, so that can speed up a little bit of, of that type of stuff. Let me just get rid of that. I don't know if people use it, but I think that this um, hack to edit. You can set materials with it. And sometimes people will use this one, but I, I tend to stick to that material set. Yeah, there's a, on my old website, um, just the mrcoons.com, there's a the resume or whatever for the, the stuff. I think I forget the, the URL for it. But this is pretty much up to date. Um, there might be some newer stuff or some short, shorter projects and stuff like that that I didn't put on the, the list, but that's uh, the, the majority of the work history. Um, so with this packs names, you can use this hierarchy kind of picker here. Um, 
And then this is another way you could find like plastic, grab it, and then find your um, plastic shader. It just depends how you want to work. There's different uh, different ways to do it, like interactively using the viewport um, with that hierarchy attribute. So you could do this picker, like a Maya outliner style or whatever. Um, yeah. So you ever use bundles when dealing with Olympic imports? I use it all the time to easily arrange groups. I, I don't use it that much. Um, my typical, I'm just going to turn off everything for a minute. I'm going to also go into my world and turn off the environment uh, lights as backgrounds. Um, you're late, player two. We're just getting, uh, yeah, we're just getting started. We haven't really done too much. The only thing we did was just make some tweaks to this asphalt shader to get it the scale of it feeling a little bit better. It was like too, um, too high frequency last time. Yeah, I'm kind of scared of bundles. <laughs> I've, I've touched them a little bit in the past, but um, I've always been, uh, I don't know, just maybe it's because I haven't done that much lighting, but usually I've, I've d done like a SOP kind of based workflow for, for lighting stuff. Um, so what I would do here is like, just look at the car visually, use that nine button and uh, start to make groups for, or materials, however you want to, to start to separate things. Um, but if we look at, let me just go back to the Kuntash. <laughs> this one, I felt like it, it um, just put this on top for a little bit. This one, I, I felt like it um, looked like in terms of the, the body, it looked pretty similar. Um, there's some differences in the scoop. I'm not sure of the, the technical name. I couldn't find one that exactly matched this model, just, just ones that were similar. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to go through and, uh, say that this, something like this is, is roughly what we're, um, going to target for, for applying the, the, uh, materials. So we're going to want a car paint shader, this like uh, yellow color, we could set it in different colors in the shader or whatever. Gamma Bassoon, how's it going? So we could select this, um, certain subsets of it. You think it's Murcielago, ooh. There it is already came in yellow. <laughs> yeah, I think the scoop is is uh, looking more accurate, yeah. This is a good reference here. Top Gear. Isn't that, that's like a British TV show? Top Gear? This is, all, this is like the lighting kind of stuff we're similar to right now. Um, so yeah, we'll, 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 uh, use this as our, our target now. Mercy. Um, yeah, so certain subsets, I would say, like, you might have to go later into, after you unpack it, because right now we only have 19, um, packed Olympics to pick from. So you might want to go into, um, more splitting to, to assign things. We basically set this up originally um, for effects purposes. So we have the wheels split out that we were um, spinning and rotating. And then this is the main body right here. And what I might do is just make an object merge. Um, so this, we we're just doing a pass through because we weren't doing any shading. Um, but over here, I can just go in and, and start to select this, hammer it out. Um, another thing, this is, uh, where did it go? This might be a little bit of like a gem, but when you're selecting, um, vehicles or models to, to work with or for 
any type of purpose. Um, if you look at these intrinsics, where did it go? Let me see. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I was blasting. Um, if you look at intrinsics, they have a bunch of different stuff. Um, one of the things that you can do is like, maybe measured volume doesn't, looks like these aren't uh, filled out right now. If I do an unpack, we definitely want to keep the path attribute around. You can see now we're getting these um, intrinsic attributes of uh, measured area, measured perimeter, and measured volume. Um, so you could use this and do at intrinsic colon measured perimeter is less than 0 0.5. Um, I'm not sure if, where, where were these values at? They're all pretty, pretty big numbers. So this is a technique you can use to grab like small pieces from a model. Um, it can be useful for not only shading, but if you're doing uh, effects workflows for debris or stuff like that, like if people would do this with um, transformers, like robots and stuff like that, that have a lot of little gears and uh, details and stuff like that in them. So if you do it the other way, now we just have the large scale um, big pieces and it's it can make it like you're just culling out the, um, it, all these little pieces might be really high poly counts, but they don't contribute that much like visually or structurally to the model. So this intrinsic thing right here is really nice. Um, I'm not sure, some, I'm not sure if they, added this um, at one point I feel like yeah you, you they even have some some options of kind of like this that they built into the Olympic um, importer itself that it, it's basically doing these same functions um, so it can be nice to have it, but sometimes as well, it's nice to be able to do this in, in SOPs without having to like rely doing it here and then you're importing things twice to get everything and then some of the things or whatever. It's pretty cool. Thanks for checking out the, the show reel extra diet. It's pretty old. I need to update it or cut one together of some of the personal projects and stuff like that, but uh, kind of waiting um, until I get more work that I've just produced outside of a studio. And then I want to cut one together that's um, just all personal, like more of a generalist reel or something where it's, I created all the, the aspects of it or whatever. So we'll just um, set this aside for right now. And uh, if I go back to the nine button, you can see we're still selecting this stuff by, um, the attributes or the uh, the path attribute. So this looks like this car body here that I've selected. Um, let me get the Mercy, Mercy Lago. Let me get it back up here. Um, yeah, so it looks like we, we got everything here with this selection. Happens to be yellow, the classic Houdini default selection color uh, matches it nicely. So sometimes I'll just do split um, and then visually I can kind of keep track of like what I'm doing. Uh, you can even name these like card body. So this can be useful um, instead of single chain working and grouping things and moving along it's easy to miss stuff and something might not get in a group and it will just always not have a shader applied to it or something like that but this way you can more explicitly say like 
this is the car body. I have a shader for that. And then just keep or pass through everything left behind or everything left over. So you can kind of um, chisel away at stuff this, this way and know that you're not really missing too much. Or hopefully you're missing. <laughs> By the time you get to the end, you're kind of like just wearing away at everything, I guess. Um, yeah, so we might want to do windows next. So just got it with the windows shape. Um, do another split. This is going to be window glass. And I just use these nulls um, so I can see what's going on on the other part of the uh, thing. Yeah, the pillars are not yellow. Um, so what's happening right now is we're still working with these as poly soups with the name attribute. Basically with the hierarchy, there's not enough granularity to um, to get some, to, to fix some of those issues. So at the end, once I've done this broad um, separation, then we can double check and like do, you're, you're gonna have to select by point numbers or do something a little bit more destructive uh, to select the, the pillars and get them. Because basically the way that this model is set up, um, if I do this nine button, we go back to the paths. It's all, it's all just one thing there. Um, basically, every, they included everything in this car body shape. If it was like a facility you were working at or, or something like that, you could reject it and just send it back to the modeler or whatever and say, rename it. Um, or if you're, it's just a little bit different or whatever, because you, you have to rely on, uh, we, we could tackle that. We'll, we'll get to it is what I'm saying. Sorry, it's just babbling. So these windows, one thing we want to check real quickly is just like the way that they're modeled. So it looks like they don't have any thickness to them. So if we set these up in the uh, shader, we either want to extrude them or we want to use the thin film um, refraction model. So thin film is just basically treating it like a soap film kind of, um, where it doesn't like, it's a soap film instead of an orb that's solid glass is, is essentially what the, the thin film is, is like it's just a sheet that the, the light uh, passes through instead of this whole cockpit being a glass orb that the people are frozen in. So we might want to keep going with kind of glass materials. Um, so you could get these fronts of the headlights, the head, headlight bays or whatever. Um, we might want to get the, the tail light stuff. I don't know if there's, this might be a good reference image for the back of things. Yeah, so I might just grab that and that, and we'll split this. And then this will be our, um, headlight glass. So now we might want to do like the black, I don't know if this is like a black mat or black rubber or something like that. Um, they might actually be like little um, mesh, like metal grate surfaces or something like that. Um, but because this, this isn't, um, it looks like this window stuff is connected. Cause this isn't like a super beauty luxury commercial type of situation we can be a little forgiving i think with some of our selection sets and stuff like that we might want to get the the wheel wells and built-in speakers 
They might want to get the wheel wells. Just this under undercarriage um, stuff as well. Yeah, so I think we're good with that. I don't really know exactly what to call this, but it was say like black map. And then we might want like a chrome, kind of a metal shader for the logo, pipes, the back of that. I guess that thing goes in the black. We'll have to split that off. We did, this is where things are, are get a little bit messy. Um, I guess this stuff is like the mirror that the lights, for the headlights hit and then bounce back the other way, like the, the focusing beams. Um, I guess I'll grab the reflectors as well. Um, and then this will be our metal stuff. Looks like we already somehow switched to doing... Fuck. <laughs> you have to be careful that that viewport stuff keeps... keeps happening. Otherwise, it's not a big deal for this because we're not going to be changing the, the point order and stuff too much. But it looks like I stopped using the 9 key and it, it stopped uh, selecting stuff by the, the name. So now with this stuff that's left over, um, I think we can just add it into the black matte material for now. Um, it's all kind of super subtle stuff that you might not see um, too much. So this, we're gonna say this is metal. Um, if we need to, we can uh, add more metal shaders to this branch, basically. So we have our subsections now. We have our um, couple different glasses, our black matte materials, and then our metals. Um, so we can start to add, refine some of these selection sets now. So with this convert, this will undo the poly soup. Um, so the when you unpack stuff, it will preserve these poly soups. Uh, it's just like a Houdini method of representing a bunch of connected faces under one polygon primitive uh, just for like rendering efficiency and stuff like that. Basically, they're saying if all the attributes and groups on them are the same, we don't need to worry about topology and connectivity and stuff. It's a bit of like a finishing stage, like you wouldn't really want to model this way because you couldn't do extrusions or stuff like that. So for lighting and rendering, it's useful, but to get access to like more of the data, sometimes you need to unsoup it, convert it. The soup, the poly soup stuff was really weird when the, I think it was like Houdini 12, 12.5 or something when they first introduced it. I remember seeing the little like broth node. This is like, what are, what are they, what are they up to here? What are these, what are these devs doing? Does each consecutive split carry on original polygon IDs? It does not. Um, one thing you can do is an, this enumerate, um, and this will record the primitive index, but unfortunately this is just going to be the poly soup index number. Um, so it's a little bit tricky to, to get everything I would say. Um, you might be able to do it like up here, but it, that would mess up these other selection sets I would do. Um, if you're in a facility or like passing this along to other departments, you would definitely want to keep the original polygons like connectivity and winding order and numbers and everything the same. I think I'll, I'll just fix it so we don't. <laughs> That's okay. Primitive polygons is that I, I understand that. 
talking to people with Maya or other experiences, like they'll say vertices versus points, and Houdini is pretty much the only software package that like makes a uh, special point to call um, points to separate them out from vertices. So I might just go back here and fix some of this naming stuff. Um, so I can show you what I mean with the, the numbers and stuff. So we were just getting the headlight glass. Um, I think we were using this with the tail light stuff as well. We'll do a split. Yeah, so that's the same. Um, if you want to, you can just copy that expression and paste it uh, just to update it. Sometimes people have written like Python scripts that can go through and do that type of stuff. But for right now, I'm just, I was trying to, to work this way and then I, I messed it up. I was like switching between too much stuff. Forgot to use the nine key. Um, so now we just want the black mat area. Shoot it to your skull art stream from a while ago. Super easy to follow and nicely explained. Shout out. <laughs> shout out. Shoot out. And results are amazing. I'm having to take on it with a different skull and using Octane. You talk about the pasta, like the, it was coming out of Beethoven's head. Cool zone stills projects. Yeah, those are, I think are pretty good for the people, especially if people are coming from like a concept art mentality or even a generalist type of mentality. In the recent one, I did go full into a smoke sim and was really going a little too too crazy. The VDB Taurus, oh, that one, yeah, that, that was a cool one with the, um, they look kind of like luxury um, skulls and stuff like that, like gold and, and, uh, and porcelain or something. <laughs> yeah, so we just wanna get the black areas again. Um, I think actually what we can do with this one, thank you for cheering. Thank you for the, uh, the bits. Um, so I think what we wanna do is get the, if we just grab the metal stuff, everything left behind will be the black mat. And, and then that's a little bit more clear uh, organization. So the metals, we are getting the mirrors, we're getting the logo, we're getting pipes. Um, I think that's it. It looks like it got some of the console and some other stuff. Um, but I think we're good. Metal or mirror, it's kind of the same thing. Um, and then this last selection here, um, all this stuff we're gonna say is the black mat. And get rid of that one, just to keep things a little bit clear. So now I could show you with this convert, um, we can go down to the full original polygons, like no soups, just the plain model. Um, then using this enumerate. Um, let me just hide these intrinsics. This makes a copy of the original um, polygon ID or the index number. Um, and then because I was splitting based off of these paths, I can put that convert in there and it doesn't mess up any of these selections. Um, and then it still retains the original uh, polygon or face index. So that would let you, um, if you start to merge these in like a different order than they were originally brought in as um, certain areas you see it doesn't match. At the very end, you could do the sort node um, and then just do this by attribute and do it by index. And then you should have exactly the same um, stuff. So if I exported this back to another software package, 
they were doing some selections based on the, the primitive number um, that shouldn't mess them up or anything. If you're doing like actually deleting and changing some winding number stuff, this might not work flawlessly, but for this basic stuff, it works pretty well. So like, if I just zoom in maybe to this area and visualize these, I don't know if this, the, <laughs> the numbers got too high to, to count. Um, or you could go to the guides, large font. Um, so you can see this, they're out of order, like at the very start. This guy is 12, 8, 3, 4, 3, and then at the end, he's still 12, 8, 4, uh, 2, 4, 3, or whatever. So this will just put them back to the, the original. But you have to you have to just be careful every step of the way to to be working like ahead of time kind of set things up this way it's really easy to go in and just start like deleting things based off of the face number and you can get into a mess that way so now with we have the original um store face id um now we want to clean up some of that stuff where did it go? So you always set up your smoke sim source using multi-solver than regular setup, what everyone is doing. Is there any particular reason why you're setting it up that way? Yeah, so the smoke, um, the typical smoke all the different solvers, sparse, um, traditional, pyro, they always have sources at the end here. I don't know why they do this. Is if you know the dots, like order of operations, this, this object is data, so it doesn't apply, but like the order that these solving inputs happen, everything happens from left to right. Um, so your pre-solve stuff happens, then your velocity gets updated, then the, the advection stage happens or things get moved around by the velocity, uh, and then the sourcing is the last step. So if you do that, then in your output of the smoke simulation, you'll always have a source that is just added to the output that isn't moved around or changed at all. Um, if you source it before the advection, then it will always get pushed and distorted a little bit and look a little bit better. Um, and then if you still want it to be in your sim, like it would be in the side effects method, you can always just merge the source to your simulation cache at the end. Uh, it's like a non-destructive step or whatever. That's why I'm always doing it uh, the very first thing before the solve. Add the source to the sim so that it gets moved and pushed around by the velocity. So you don't have smooth blobby sources or just... It all looks more natural because you don't have the, the actual source. Yeah, so I don't know why they set it up that way. Like other fume effects and... Uh, the ILM fluid solver, the proprietary one or whatever, their methods, they were sourcing and then doing advection and all the other steps. You're also using the SOP solver gas particle to field, etc., because you're lever leveraging your GPU. Yeah, I think sourcing with particles is faster for the GPU. Like bringing particles into DOPS is quicker than bringing um, an entire volume, especially when you're doing like velocity vectors and stuff like that. And then the particles will always get rasterized or stamped in at whatever your grid resolution is, um, or your sim simulation resolution. So you don't need to worry about uh, having your source volume like a lower resolution or too high of a resolution or just a slow operation of... Usually the shelf tools or all, this, all the setups and stuff, your, the source just to like create the volume takes like, can take a minute or two minutes per frame um, so just for speed and performance and stuff like that is the particle to field. 
It seems like all the other, even their shelf tools now are using particles, but they're still rasterizing them before the input. Um, but in terms of designing and getting good motion, uh, I think particles is just art artistically like easier to control and uh, sculpt the forces and stuff that you want. So we need to get this stuff split out a little bit more. Um, now that I did this first split based off of that name um, attribute, sometimes you can see now my selector is going into just like individual faces. Um, sometimes what you can do is use a connectivity node. Um, just set that to primitive. So this will assign 3D connectivities. Um, and then if I do the nine button, you can select it by class. It looks like this. I don't know if this is glass. We could just do it like it is right now. Uh, so you can do that option. You can also just, um, you can see they already have built in like UV and 3D connectivity. So sometimes it's useful. The UV stuff doesn't look too useful. But you can do 3D connectivity with this picker. Uh, it's kind of the same idea. So it looks like these black, oh, looks like the black uh, fins or whatever. You need to separate those. I think the, that was definitely yellow. Um, looks like we already have that black bar. I think we're good. Now it looks like one of those reference. <laughs> yeah, the final render. We <laughs> finished it. So, um, yeah, we have the different areas. I can just do a split here. Um, and then this stuff is gonna be black mats material. If we really want to, we could make this stuff glass, but for right now, I'm just gonna keep, keep going just to work a little bit more quickly. Um, I've been using Houdini uh, since, Uh, with Linux, you can just do always on top for any window. Uh, so a, just Linux, you can also roll up these windows. It's pretty cool. If you have like a bunch of reference images and stuff, um, you can kind of do like funny little things like that to uh, to manage your your scene. <laughs> Is I don't know. It's like one of the advantages and disadvantages of of Linux. Like you can do that crazy stuff, but also the, sometimes the desktop settings is just there's too many um, options and stuff like that that make it a little bit fussy when you set stuff up. Um, yeah, so th I'm sorry, the uh, so, so the, the Houdini stuff, I think on my Vimeo, if you really want to take the time to like go through it, um, you could kind of see the progress of the Houdini stuff that I did over time. Um, I think the, the Vimeo stuff is such a mess. You have to like manually edit the URLs. Um, yeah, so if you just go to this page, I think this is like roughly when I had first started using Houdini like nine years ago or something. Yeah, I don't <laughs> I feel like nobody's even really using Vimeo anymore. Um, but yeah, it was like nine years ago, I was working at this, I did an internship at this record label. Um, so I was like figuring out just how to use Houdini to make little like advertisements or marketing, like visualization kind of stuff for them. Um, so like this one, this is like a placeholder thing that they used on their YouTube channel. And then there was like an album art that went here um, that could get swapped out kind of procedurally or whatever. 
Um, yeah, so that's when I just first started using it. And like this kind of stuff is just literally like the downloading Houdini, doing some of the sample files from the forums or something like that. So yeah, that's that stuff. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't think we see anything wrong with the window glass. Um, the headlight glass. I think if we look at this stuff, it does have some... I guess it's still the thin film. It's not a closed surface. This stuff, we might want to add the outer perimeter of it to, to be black. Um, I don't know if this... Looks like they aren't islands. It's going to be a long selection process, so I'm not going to do that right now. So I think we're... I think if we just start making some shaders and stuff like that, we might be okay. What do you guys think? Do you have any objections? <laughs> Alright, so that we can switch this wire here. This is our main area, and then if I just do a merge down here. Explosion stuff in the future. Um, yeah, I might go back and do some some explosives. Uh, seems like there's a lot of good information with it right now, um, so I've been staying away from it just to uh, just so I'm not like rehashing a bunch of other tutorials and stuff um, that are already available. But it. Uh, it would be interesting to do it going really deep into like control fields and some of the micro solvers and stuff like that. We all want to see the end result already. <laughs> yeah, so we'll keep going. Um, sometimes what I'll do is just start with these um, individually and apply the materials. Okay, so this this is the wrong one. So we want to just do our shading stuff. Yeah. All right. So I might take one of our cameras here, maybe um, just make a new one. It will be kind of like a close up. This is just going to be like a look dev kind of camera. Um, we go into you need to refresh the it's always time to shades <laughs> sometimes you need to refresh the redshift viewer to get your all your cameras we'll just go a bit higher with the focal length it's like the nascar sports photography Oops. All right, that's good enough. Um, yeah, and then I'm just gonna start making my material network. I'm gonna do another one inside of this vehicle. Um, this way, if you copy and paste, like you, you copy and paste this into the scene or into another scene, it's almost like a little, it's not like you're on your way to making a digital asset or it's a little bit more self-contained. All right, so do not that we want the builder. Um, we'll do the body, uh, glass, metal, and black mat. We'll just get started, I guess, with that. All right, so now if I go right here, I can link this up. This is the wrong one. You just gotta be careful when you're making more than one of these to so we'll get the body. And um, we're gonna do a test. You can 
just change something like that. Looks like it doesn't work. So our render flag over here is still on the other chain. Um, if we want to do our tests, we can just move it. I'm just going to go directly up to that. So now we're getting the shader application. So if we wanted to, we could um, use the color picker. Kind of hard because it's like there's already some reflections and stuff baked into some of these, but it might be a good closer kind of starting point. Um, so obviously the lighting conditions and stuff will change it a little bit, but we should be a little bit better shape with that. I think there's a little bit more like greens, a little less greens, a little bit more like orangish reds or something in there. Um, that feels a little bit closer. Still pretty, uh, yeah, I don't know. This is a good starting point. Um, do you guys have any go-tos? Feels warmer. Do you guys have any go-tos with your um, Redshift stuff? Whoa, whoa, <laughs> this chat's moving fast. Yeah, you should do one explosion because Houdini seems to be changing very fast. It's really hard to understand it with even a one-year-old tutorial. I saw a missile trail stuff I was thinking about uh, doing something with today. Um, it might, this might be more of a procedural smoke method or whatever, but, um, setting something up like this, like the, uh, the procedural cloud modeling techniques I was showing uh, a couple weeks ago where I built a sphere and then I was doing the volume stamp. I think it's called volume stamp or something. Countermeasures. <laughs> yeah, so um, doing something like this, it could be an interesting tutorial. Uh, it might just be like a backplate for the environment, but show, just showing how to do like some procedural smoke trails. I feel like that's something that um, I, I haven't really seen a lot of tutorials for. But yeah, just doing a general kind of explosion could be uh, could be fun. I also saw someone, um, where did it go? You late to the party? <laughs> you missed all the boring stuff, Julian. We, j we were just organizing our scene. But yeah, this was a, a blender uh, render that I thought looked pretty cool. This is the, I'd be really nice. Uh, wet shader, wet pavement shader, and how it reacts to the, uh... I don't know if this is like different anisotropy or um, just some very subtle deformations of like the surface normal to get it bending around and stuff like that. I've been learning Houdini for one year and I feel like I have to go back to some old projects to review some stuff I did because I can't remember everything. You think that's normal? Does that happen to you? Sometimes I feel frustrated because I spend like one month without doing pyro and then end up forgetting a lot of stuff because I focus on another thing for a while. Yeah, I mean, that's why just over time I've tried to keep things pretty organized because I do go back to old files, not only for reference, but just to save time. If you're really under the gun for a project and you need like something to run with, you can just grab it and uh, instead of taking a couple of days to get Situated with it, you're just up and running pretty quick. Blenders is cool, support UDIM, and Cycles is fast. Yeah, it would be really nice if Cycles was in, uh, there's, there, there's one guy working on changing it to Houdini, but I don't know if he's gonna release it. Finally got into the stream. <laughs> Da, 4-1-K. 
Thanks for, for making the jump over from the uh, recorded ones. Yeah, it's nice to have people help, helping me out when I'm struggling with uh, material assignments or not. <laughs> I, I had a bad glitch yesterday that took a while. Blender supports VDB. I bring VDB from Houdini and render smoke inside Blender. AWS Linux Ubuntu command line rendering. Yeah, I think um, that's pretty impressive. And then Blender with EV as well. Like if you just really need very quick interactive like previews or you're just really working at a fast pace is, is pretty uh, handy to have that as well. So um, yeah, so I was gonna mess around with this. I don't know what you guys' approaches with these um, our body stuff, but I'm usually using this reflection and going, I've, I'm not super experienced with um, rendering vehicles and stuff like that, but I'm usually doing roughness on base, yeah, and then the coat layer is closer to a mere um, reflection. So this is like the wide rough spec and then under the coating, this one is the mirror, mirror like crisp one. I don't know what you guys have IORs do you recommend? Sometimes people go quite high with this. this is a <laughs> like a gold. Depends on the material, but for a regular paint job, yeah, same. They make a cycles doc for other application like Maya and Houdini. Do you think it will have a shift in the industry? Uh, it's hard to tell. Um, so like the, with USD, basically that it wouldn't necessarily need to even be a plugin or, or stuff like that. Like basically hooking up renders to other Software packages should be a lot easier. There's a whole spec for it called Hydra. That's like render hooks or whatever that, that uh, is part of the USB spec. Um, so, so ideally that would get easier. I don't know how much of a, um, how much of a change it would have on the entire industry. It seems like um, it seems like Cycles is nice to have because it's free and it's better than Mantra, but when I've tried certain certain tests with like interior rendering, um, V-Ray has outperformed it and then uh, definitely Redshift and GPU renders are, are seem a little bit faster than, than Cycles, but it's definitely really probably the best free like open source engine available. Uh, I don't use an IOR table. I've, I've looked at them a lot over time and I have a pretty good sense of kind of the values and stuff like that. I don't really use them that much. And then I, they do have this like other more advanced methods of using values, but for what, for this situation, I think it's okay. Like. If you're really doing product um, advertisements or stuff where clients are really like getting picky about stuff, then you could get into to more of that territory, I think. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm planning to do here. Um, base the AMRA. So this base reflection is the broad base uh, specular, and then this coat is the guy on top. So it's a pretty standard thing. Um, sometimes people add the flakes. I don't know if there's redshift. I guess they actually have a car paint node. Probably could have just switched, <laughs> switched over to that. But I think we're good with this, the base one. Um, this one has some special settings and stuff. I guess I ended up, this looks a little bit more mirror-like. Um, but they have some special stuff for the metallic flakes that some cars have. Um, 
But I think overall, it looks like that one's using glossiness instead of roughness and some differences. You can see the flakes a little bit there at the end. But um, I think just being able to make a car paint shader, knowing the, the standard shader pretty well, is nice because uh, that techniques will translate over to like Arnold or other V-Ray, like other, other renders, you can make a car paint shader pretty quickly. Best is okay. <laughs> Bossed. So you, you do it uh, just bossed? Like a German saying it's best? It's bossed. Yeah, so we can go, um, we can just go back to the, this one. I think we, we ended up, yeah. <laughs> I think we ended up um, pretty, Pretty close in some of these areas. Again, it's hard to know because of the lighting conditions necessarily. Um, like this color temperature of these, this exterior environment here is a little bit more um, blue green, and this seems a little bit more like I don't know overcast or something. So that's the body. <laughs> we're we're making progress somewhat. Just do a save just in case we're cursed or hexed. And, uh, oh no. All right, so somehow that file save, the IPR didn't like it, but I just rebooted it and we're back. So we can go next to our window glass. Um, so I already made an empty container for it. You wanna do the spoilers next? I think that makes, I guess that makes sense. We kind of go start really broad and just narrow, narrow our way down. Um, yeah, so this is gonna be the black. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not exactly sure what this material is i'm gonna try to kind of play it like it's a, a rubber type of thing um we just need to keep moving this node around here to get the different areas so all of these are just default ones uh the first commercial not necessarily a big project uh, I was actually working as a compositor and retoucher for a little bit before starting with Houdini. Um, and then with Houdini, the first project was uh, the Project Almanac movie. You think this... <laughs> so I was doing the color picker from, from the thing. Um, I don't have a hex table converter handy. But uh, I think we ended up pretty pretty close to to where we where we should be um but, but yeah project almanac was bust always has the precise measured values on hand it's got these still need to be uh divided let's see how how close we were um so sometimes you can just do this color maker this is just like a thing um and then these need to go normalize them so that they're like zero to one I actually don't know about this this color picker I'm not a fan of this <laughs> cycles is very cool when you put it in your scene in cloud no matter about your license yeah it's definitely nice to have to, if you're deploying stuff on a large scale and everything to not have to worry about uh, the license servers and especially for clouds where it's like you need to do special um what is it like uh a um vpn license servers and all that stuff is can be a mess um but yes yeah, so the what i was going to say about this color maker i don't like it because uh it doesn't actually show you the value um i think there was a different 
There's a different node or something that I was using. I might have just been doing like... I think I was just using the color mix um, and leaving the mix amount at zero and then just using this like a color maker. Then you can actually um, visualize the color and use a picker if you want. It's kind of the redshift nodes aren't that uh, intuitive sometimes. So this looks like it might be a little too to, um, whoops, I, I messed up a bunch of stuff there. This looks like it's a little too cool. We'll see what happens. Yes, this might be, I don't know about the, it might be a color space thing, like sRGB um, or something like that. Sometimes I find that like going to the manufacturer's measured results, that depends on uh, some other maths and balancing stuff. It's like you, if you're working this way, sometimes you might need to calibrate the rest of your um, render environment and everything to uh, to the same acquisition settings that they got when they measured these values. Um, but for for quick, like if you're doing a database of like engineering materials, some some uh, companies I've worked at have set up very specific measurement uh, light booths and stuff like that. And then you can use these measured values a bit easier. But for this, I'm just going to stick with the, the guess. <laughs> so I'll go back to the next black area. This is just using the empty shader. Um, it's from the manufacturer. Anyway, no, it's not interfering. It's not. <laughs> It's nice to explain that and talk through everything. Um, like all of the stuff with the, if you're using the measured IOR values, any of the measured, even roughness, like I always use, it's good, really good as a starting point, but then it's nice to always just trust your eye um, to really dial stuff in, especially if, if you go have references out and you're getting close to it. Um, like I was saying, this the environment and time of day and stuff like that might matter quite a bit. But at the end of the day, for commercials or things like that, like if you're satisfying a client, they're if you just say I'm using the measured value, they're not going to accept that. They're they're going to say it doesn't look right because they're going to get in trouble if if it doesn't look right. So it kind of works that way. But um, you're working more of an engineering department and stuff then you could like actually figure everything out and get everything <clears throat> sorted so that it's responding properly. But a lot of like commercials and visual effects, it's just breaking things and changing things until it's satisfies the, the customer essentially. <laughs> like I had a visual effects supervisor that uh, at the end of client calls, he would joke and say like, do they want fries with that? Because it was like, he was just saying it's basically like you're a fast food worker and you just, whatever they ask for, you just have to do it and, and give it to them. So this is going to be our black kind of rubberish material. Um, all of these ones I just started with the default settings. Um, they do have some presets you can use sometimes, but this one I'm just going to go somewhat close to like a rubber type of thing. So very, very little diffuse response. And then the uh, reflection, just quite rough with that. Maybe, I don't know if you're really saying it's like a matte black rubber, just uh, not even a lot of reflection. But this gets a little bit more of like a leather or something like that, I feel like. I think that's, close enough it's black so it's we're doing this it's going to be at night so we're we can be pretty quick with that one um and then we can go to the metal next i'm just kind of going from biggest to smallest with this order of everything um worked a lot with designers where i have to turn their abominations into something buildable 
Yeah, it's always, uh, there's always just different problems with different, working with people of different skills. The designers, some of the designers I've worked with are pretty interesting because they're always wanting to use like iso isometric cameras or wild focal lengths of like two, 200, uh, thousand or 2000 just so all the perspective lines and stuff are straight and like so sometimes they even will change the film back position to like offset the perspective lines to, to have it's just each each expertise is paying attention to like different aspects of the project so it can get uh hard or just they just want you to address things in different ways so this metal, um, I think, did it switch it over? Okay, so I forgot to do this step. Um, grab the metal shader. And again, this defaults to just plastic kind of shader. Um, if we're doing a metal, Usually this IOR, you can just go pretty high with it. Like the, the higher you go, it's closer to a mirror. Um, and I think it's okay to go quite high with these these values, especially for a metal or mirror type of surface. Um, if you look at some of the presets, if I just do, I don't know, like silver, it uses these color values the more one of the more advanced methods but if you just go back to IOR you can see that their silver value is pretty high as well um, and then I think if you really want like an actual mirror if you go to um, where is it somewhere you just have to turn off the um, what is it this Overall, somewhere you can turn off the um, kind of for now, maybe metalness. So it's just different with different shading models, but I think this is like an actual mirror. Um, Maybe I need to fill the diffuse. I'm not sure how the, how my metalness got a bit darker, but I, I'm just going to stick with IOR. Um, I'm a little bit more comfortable working that way. And basically, this is like kind of logarithmic. Like once you get above a certain number, it doesn't have too much of of an effect. The higher you go, with metalness, the diffuse color is relevant. Ah, even if the weight is all the way down. Making it white would create a similar look to a stupid high IR. Okay, yes, I just did that and it, it seems to match now. Sometimes, I guess this redshift materials don't have it. Um, but if you like this, if you're disabling the IOR completely, um, you'll start to just get a pure mirror, like actual perfectly uh, reflective mirror. So this all this IOR stuff will try to make it. Um, get less bright at the edges, like more of a diffuse, and then the higher you go with that. Yeah, V-Ray has that. I, I think that's why I was thinking about it. Um, but yeah, I think this is okay to get started with for our metal. So finally, <laughs> perfectly uh, produced vehicle fresh out of the factory. So we, we got our glass coming up next. Um, what I did right now is just made one glass shader. If we need to branch out, we can go in and uh, set up some separate stuff. But I think for right now, we could even just start with this glass. Um, and then what happens is this thinks it's always expecting the, the ray to hit another surface to basically say we're going outside of the glass. But because these are all thin sheets, they don't have thickness. Um, it just thinks that as soon as the ray hits it, everything that goes through it is, it thinks it's like traveling through glass. So it gets really distorted. Um, 
So if you just turn on thin walled or thin film, depending on like your shader or renderer you're using, that is what will basically say, this is a glass sheet, treat it like a very thin double-sided surface. Um, and again, IOR I think is, uh, I think it's important a little bit to change the kind of you get closer to like a plastic water or something like that. Um, I think with, if you want to do tint and stuff like that as well, like you can, I think with tint you would, I think you would just turn down refraction weight. It's like absorbing some of the light as it goes through it. Um, but yeah, I might go a little bit higher than than the glass setting with the, the IR just to get it a little bit more uh, reflective. All right, so you can do the same thing now with the actual windshields. And you can see what happens when we put it all together. Oof. <laughs> It looks kind of like a car, not not very close. Certain areas are working well. The, the biggest issue right now is this top uh, pillar or the connector of the pillar is different. Um, should be yellow. And I think we'll be good for right now after that. Um, so we'll just We'll just make that adjustment very quickly. Would want to change this eventually, but just to, just to keep things moving, um, we're just going to do broad strokes for right now. We need to go in our black mat area. Um, I think I split it out in this step. Um, so if I just do a null right here to kind of stay organized. Um, I think we're gonna have to grab this stuff kind of manually. We could try the, if I do the nine button, um, instead of 3D connectivity, we could try like UV. Looks like that doesn't work. We don't have groups. We don't really have any other information. We'll just go out of that uh, selection. I'm going to turn off the environment right now. Sometimes you can get stuff with the double clicking with the edge loops like that. Um, I don't know if there's a good method to extend. Maybe if I do, oof, didn't get it. Might be able to do that. I don't, there's a lot of hotkeys for the Houdini selection sets, but I've never, um, I've never learned them that well. I think one thing that I'll do sometimes, just to check, if you do the five, go out of this, uh, with escape, if you do, maybe, yeah, you go into this mode, you do five. Sometimes you can select stuff in UV space, and then you can visually like see the areas you were trying to get. Um, it looks like there's just too much stuff in that area right now. We need to get back to the perspective view. Somehow my hotkeys are, are a mess. Um, so I should be able to do escape and press one. And now we're back in the perspective view. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna go into wireframe and I'm just gonna try to select it kind of like this.
sometimes doing these um, selections that you could go to the lasso. Um, so this way you can just define the shape. It's probably just going to be close enough for <laughs> it's a pretty bad hack, but for what we're doing. Basically, I'm trying to use the best methods until we get like out of um, out of little tools or tricks we can use, and then we have to resort to uh, the bad, the dark side, the dark magic. So you can do a split with that stuff. Um, and we want to merge this with the rest of the, the body. So now we should have all that. And then this other connector, just do change wire. And we're, should be back in order. So this is going to be a little confusing, but basically we're splitting this a few times. I'll just do some quick descriptions here to stay somewhat organized. This is going to be our glass. This is going to be another glass. And this is the metal. And this is the black mat. All right. So we have this part done. We still have the tires left. So we should, this is just gonna take a second to update. Um, this should be a little bit easier, I think just cause it's a few areas should just be a couple of materials i think we have the rubber for the tires and then we have the um metal bits some of it is i guess you have different rims you can use and stuff like that um i'm thinking it just design wise it might be best to have our rims somewhat black um just to really notice like when the smoke starts coming out it just pops and it's just more uh, visually should be uh, looking a little bit more more uh, graphic less like distracting bits or whatever um, so we'll probably just reuse that black matte shader for all of this stuff and then the tires outside we can make like a somewhat special uh, tire shader for them Sometimes you do like displacements um, or bump maps and you could get, we'll see if we could get a little extra detail. This is like racing slicks or something that he's burning up <laughs> right now. Um, so let's see what we have. The rear, the front. Um, if I go to the spreadsheet, it does look like we should be able to split stuff up based off of the name, that path attribute. Uh, the hierarchy name. Looking good! Ezekiel, Unreal Engine 5. <laughs> Is it Unreal Engine 5? Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're still, we're slowly making progress. It's like a slow, <laughs> slow day today with the car. But uh, we'll, we'll do it. So, this out right here, I was just doing for uh, bookmark purposes and I was merging stuff to do the render uh, or visualize. We'll just have to make another combination for, for render purposes. Um, I think I can just split stuff at the end of this merge. Um, and if I just do it based off of, again, pressing the nine button. Um, you're from the future. <laughs> How long did you have this name for? You had it before um, before the, the engine came out. Um, all right. So we're gonna go to the gear here, do Alembic paths again. 
um, and then I can just quickly grab the rubber bits. And I think with this one, I can just do a material like this. Um, so this is going to be the rubber black alloy wheels. This you're saying that's an alloy material. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> um, you saying that this is an alloy since the day it was announced. You, you wanted that, that uh, you wanted that underline or the, that uh, username before it got taken. Just wait till the zombies rise. So you're saying that this is the black alloy extradite? Or you're, are, are you thinking it's a little bit different than this? I guess this is a little bit more, um, it does have more specular. So we could dial that in separately. Um, so sometimes what I do if I just have two simple material assignments like this, um, I'll assign the first material, which will be our black alloy to everything, not using any group name. And then with this one, I'll use the filtered selection and say just the rubber areas um, override just those. So if you're just doing simple things, you don't necessarily need to split out and do that. Basically, as just say, Everything gets the alloy, and then specifically these rubber bits will, will override them. So I can go in here, and then we're gonna have uh, a couple more materials to our alloy. And uh, we'll do the tire. So now if I go back here, um, this first one, we want to assign alloy to everything. And I might just bypass that for right now. And uh, our render thing is already configured. I'm just gonna dial in. So if we want to get a little bit closer to those references with our alloy. Um, after the acid rains, Oh my, <laughs> the soul from the future. So uh, I think just reducing the roughness, bringing up the the IOR a little bit more. Um, we're getting closer to a. <laughs> I don't know. We're gonna. We need to. We might need to get mods happening. Um, Yes, I think this is looking okay. Someone lost. Uh, so I think we just can move on to the rubber stuff. I don't know. What do you guys, uh, maybe we want to go like extra, a little bit darker black. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, with the tire tread, we can go in <laughs> shiny tires. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think can that happen with the with this? Just yeet, start yeeting people. Did it work? <laughs> is that what that's for? <laughs> All right. So, um, we, so we just need our tire and, uh, we'll just assign, link it up. So we have, <laughs> so we have uh, our tire material and assign that. And, uh, already it's a little bit different because of the, the stuff. But um, we can do something a little bit extra. What I'm going to do with this texture node, I'm just going to kind of visualize the um, UV map quickly. <laughs> Kim's stopping by. He's like, <laughs> I want to witness the first. Um, 
So I think at the bottom here, I, had, I, I do have a tire bump map I kind of want to try. But uh, first I might just do this. It looks like we don't really have UV information on these tires. Well, my idea, basically you can find simple little tire tread stuff um, and, and have it going along. I don't know if there's a quick way to to get that set up. Um, some Trackmania style <laughs> yellow tires. So this is the brake rotor. Hi Lou, how's it going? So we want a little bit, yeah, I've seen some that are different colors. Um, it's like red or something like that. We could, we could add that maybe to our metal group for right now. Um, dial it in more if we need to but we should be able to do that uh, right here with our selection sets just grab this break discs okay. and then do another material with the tab menu um, then I can just go in here for metal and grab that I Lou, thank you for the sub. I appreciate it. Coming in here strong today. Let's go. <laughs> you hate shading brake rotors? Do they have a special anisotropy to them or something? Seems maybe they're like the scraped. Usually the calipers that are different colors. Oh, the calipers are the that area. I'm, I, don't, I don't know the, my terminology. Um, but I wanted to take a look at these wheels um, very quickly. I'm trying to see like, it looks like these do have UV attributes here. I don't know if we lost them at a certain point. Chris Arn, how's it going? The brake caliper is a bright metal. Did I get it? So I'm still, I'm still, uh, let me, let me try to take a look at these tires. I don't know how this, let me try this. I know you need to convert. I think some of this stuff is still, yeah. So this stuff was still poly souped. Um, it's possible that's what was causing redshift, not to see the UV attribute. Ooh, start our render going again. Oof, we need to do this step earlier. We, <laughs> we got something. All right, so if I do that, My paths should still stick around. I might just have to refresh the render view. Um, did it get it? New isolate selected is nice in Houdini. I haven't, uh, I don't think I've tried that. Somehow my You try with the isolate selected then redshift up here. Is that thing cursing me. Um, let me see here. We have path. We're getting shop material. Might be the path. Let me let me stop this and just do some debugging. Yeah, so it looks like somehow this path attribute isn't getting preserved.
So I had done everything up, up above using the path attribute. So I should be safe doing this so convert up here. Um, and then I'm just going to do this maybe for each uh, named primitive. Um, so when this, just need to update this, these attributes to path. Um, so when this loop runs through, it will just go through the, each uh, entry in the hierarchy. And then I can just copy uh, manually the, the path over. So not color, uh, we want to get the path. So now if I go back to all of them, we've converted them from polysoups and then we still have uh, the path attribute. So I think um, sometimes that's just a little bit buggy with uh, limbic and polygon soups and stuff like that, but um, we should be okay. And then as I was doing all of these selections based off of the, the path, we can do this step earlier. So it isn't time dependent. If I did it at the end, because uh, we're spinning these tires, you see we have this time dependent flag. Basically every frame, every time it cooked, this model would keep getting unpacked uh, or like for each converted, copied, and that might mess up motion blur or stuff like that that's um, deformation based. You just click on the noise in the material graph and it will show you the noise in the render as you plug in the node directly into the output. Ah, that's, that is pretty useful. I didn't know about that. There's also the um, render info. I don't know if I'm, for whatever reason, it always pops out of the window like this. Um, but I don't know if I'm not advanced enough to use it, but it's like, I don't know how to, how to read it basically. <laughs> So now we should be able to assign these materials because um, we preserved that path attribute. And you can see it does work. So you're saying, you guys were saying this is the calipers part here. And maybe my break stuff might be a little bit too bright. I did the metal, but it's just a bit, um, it's not 100% like the reference. But I'm just going to keep going with the tire stuff for right now. Um, so I just grabbed this tire bump texture. Like you could find some online, just Google search for tire tread bump or something like that. Um, you could find some that are tileable. So I think with one of these, this is the horizontal direction. With the vertical stuff, you could tile it and get it to repeat a little bit better. You need the brush metal anisotropy map happening. And then, I don't, do I have the brush? I think I saw it. It might be in the main body somewhere. The bright red is the caliper. I thought I saw that maybe in the main body. I'm not sure. I'm going to finish these tires. Um, so basically this, we should be able to use it as a bump. Um, we could play around with the frequency a little bit more if we need to. Um, I think we wanted these things a little bit darker for black. Um, the roughness, I'm going to make them quite shiny. Um, I'm kind of making them shinier than you would think right now, because once I add the bump, I think that will kind of add, make them appear a little bit more rough than they do right now. The metal on the tires is the hardest part. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna, maybe we'll do a second pass on some of these shaders with tweaks and stuff, but I'm hoping to get it pretty, uh, Pretty dialed in pretty quickly. As I say that after spending two hours just, just setting it up. Is this a is this a slow for for you guys for for um, shading a car? Be like a boomer. 
just lost, lost in the sauce. Um, so you could do a displacement, I believe. I don't know if we need to do, or I think they have it with the bump, bump map. Um, this is going to be our texture, and you can plug this just into bump. Um, and then you can see we're getting our, our uh, kind of like a fake displacement, like it doesn't affect the edges, it just affects the uh, shading position. Just moves the, sh the position when it's shading it, but not um, if, like physically moving it. Um, and then I think the scale, like we had the same issue kind of with the, the other stuff. It's good, <laughs> it's relaxing. I think the most one of the most relaxing things is to make a uh, marble shader. It's like a good hobby activity. You just have a library built up. It's like the computer graphics version of like whittling wood. You just sit down on the weekend and like do the Perlin noise for the veins and just have different uh, subsurfaces and like just make a different stone marble stuff up each day. So I think um, we might need a little bit more roughness. I think these, I don't know if these things are kind of going the wrong way. I don't know, this looks a little bit better. I don't think we want to do that. Just trying out one of those frequency things. Um, could try pushing on this a little bit more. I think so, sometimes when you bump stuff too much, you get just artifacts. Um, it's like kind of bumping through itself. You get those harsh kind of lines. You could also try maybe going like a negative zero centered kind of offsets or maybe flipping it around. I think this was better the other way. So I'm just bringing the IOR down a little bit. I think that helps us get a little bit closer to a uh, rubber. Um, I think maybe it would be reduce the roughness if we, if we do have the IOR down a little bit. I think it's close enough for now. Um, let's take a look at everything together. See what see what happens. Um, so if we have our spinning wheels here, what I can do is just make an object merge from that, um, and then I can just drag that over. We should be able to uh, just merge everything together over here now. Oops, it's working. Pretty slappily. So we're a little closer. <laughs> Just, everything's a little flat. Um, I'm gonna take a look at those um, at those tires. Go back to box picking. Turn that off. Um, so. This, this is it right here, right, Steve? This is the, um, the caliper. You think I should displace the tire? Looks like it is. So I might do, I might go in with the calipers and separate them. Um, 
It's not a very good one. It's like a blob. Someone just took a spear and expanded it or something. But I think maybe having a red um, paint or something like that on it could be kind of nice. Um, but if I just, it looks like they already had them set there with the brakes shape. So I think I can do a material um, just at the end here and do an override specifically for that. Uh, we'll do caliper. Um, red are quicker, <laughs> two extra HP. Um, so I think with the caliper, I can use the car paint as like a starting point. Um, it's gonna be colored, kind of painted metal, I guess. Um, and then with this tire, we, we can go in and just try a displacement. Um, I don't know if we, do you know if you cannot separate the material properties or I need to put them in a different object? I want to just enable displacements. Might be fine for now, yeah, for the final pass. Um, so if we need to, um, we want to do displacements for these, we would need to turn on displacements up here. I don't know if there's a shader. Some render engines, you can override this at the shader level. Um, but if we want to get to that extra detailed level, uh, we would want to split them out so that we're not turning on subdivisions for the entire vehicle, because it's a lot of geometry that it would start to tessellate and do all that stuff. Um, but yeah, let's just go in with our stuff here. Give him the boost, the extra HP. Um, I just need to double check that I was getting that material assigned. 200 horses, 500 horses. Let's just see what happens. You're gonna use 500 horses in this economy? I don't know if they were up like reversed. It's a little suspicious here, why they're completely black like that. Um, sometimes the normals get a little messed. Ah, yeah, I think somehow they just didn't have normals on them. So I think this is a, they're pretty, um, you wanna switch to mantra right now? <laughs> We have two more days to we switch. <laughs> yeah, so this, it's not the greatest caliper model. It's just like a little, yeah, it's a nice detail, I guess. Um, again, we're planning to do some lights when we switch to nighttime, but for, for right now, let's just kind of keep moving a little bit. Um, might go back and do another pass on the ground stuff. I think it's still a little bit, those little stone details and stuff feel like a little large. Whoops, that was like way too much. I think I wanted to go close to like 10. Lops is the much hassle for freelancers. Get some smoke going. Yeah, the karma is a little intimidating. I need to spend more time learning the lops based stuff. But ideally, yeah, it would be um, you just flip the switch and your assignments and everything like that. You can benchmark and like try out different renders and you would have a lot more flexibility. Um, so I might go down to nine, maybe. I think that's just a touch better. Um, and then, I don't know, we might want to 
go back to uh, only if you're making the shaders for both render delegates. I was trying some. Um, I was trying some stuff like that. They had the NVIDIA attic scene that that was just like a generic. Um, USD asset and I'd imported it into Solaris and all the shaders and um, like in Karma I still got the texture maps like so some things were linked up um, so I don't know if you're doing like if you're doing um, what is it called the OSL um, if you're using like a standardized they have Material X is uh, an NVIDIA or an Arnold thing, but like there, there's hopefully there will be a universal material, at least for this kind of hard surface shader kind of thing. And then just like managing and relinking textures, which is the biggest pain you could maybe get around that. That's in a perfect world, <laughs> you know, CG utopia. Um. I mean, I was with the NVIDIA attic scene, I was getting, um, got another yeeter coming by. Um, so, so, uh, like you could try it. It was just the NVIDIA attic scene. Um, I, I could do it once we start rendering or something. I still have it on, on the disc. Um, but yeah, like they had little wood blocks and the texture maps uh, were, I think, embedded into the USD files. But um, yeah, OSL, I think, is pretty close for Redshift from what they've said. Um, but yeah, even if you look at the USD spec, they do already have a mechanism just for doing rudimentary texture placements, uh, like UV offsets and stuff like that. Um, and defining that directly in the USD, like, I think it will get closer to a universal shader, like not having to, if you, if you're doing effects and you're doing like procedural noises and point cloud lookups and stuff, it will never work, but, um, getting good at eating people <laughs> going to turn into a author authoritarian, which the power is too, <laughs> too overwhelmed with it. Um, so let me think. You might want to try going back to this. I don't know if we want to do displacement. Um, I've been doing a value of two for this normal map. Um, I don't know if there's a way to. Have you ever have you guys ever tried combining like a bump? Um, with the normal. Is that possible? Am I a madman? Nope. <laughs> I'm just trying to see what happens because we do have that height value here that I was originally using as a displacement. Um, map but i don't know if this is giving us just using it for bump instead of the normal um in my mind like it's it should be kind of possible where the bump is like initially applied and then do it i don't i, I just don't know how to do it that's why i wasn't um but yeah in my mind like the bump is the broad big stroke kind of movement of the the surface at render time and then the normal is like specular highlights and stuff gets even uh broken up even more so that's why it seems like right now i'm struggling to get um the large scale kind of like movement uh, displacement of stuff i don't know if it's the bump blender maybe you just do additive mode See what happens. Additive. Do this weight. One. I mean, it's definitely feels. 
feels a little bit <clears throat> more like asphalt now. It was getting kind of oddly like gray or, or a bit weird before. Um, so I might just do some snapshots and see what happens. So this is the, we'll do a first snapshot with the blender. I believe doing an additive combination of these two. Um, then the next one will just be only bump. Um, and then, where did it go? The last one will just be normal. I think I should have lowered the, the noise threshold stuff a little bit. But yeah, I think, so this, just doing the normal by far is not looking very good at all. Um, so I think just, just doing the bump is pretty interesting. But I think doing this is adding a little bit of uh, breaking up the specular highlight a little bit on the uh, top of the rocks. What do you guys think? Say it, say with it. The smoke. <laughs> You're the. Uh... <laughs> We're in the tweak zone. You didn't think we were gonna get there so early today. All right, there we have it. Um, I might try. I didn't. I wasn't trying it yesterday, but um, I might just do the. Um, just gonna get rid of these. Do some yeeting. I I was trying to get rid of that. Uh, you just do that one. Um, yeah, just way too. Uh, worried about this is the details um yeah so i'm gonna try the smoke with this stuff um in a daylight environment and just kind of see i feel like yesterday we might have been getting a little messy with like using the other light and setting things up that way um basically like you're just not using very accurate like measurements if you're doing look dev with like a spotlight. Um, all right. We have the smoke it's looking quite sooty. Um, let's just double check, make sure we're not doing that blunder we <laughs> spent yesterday on and it looks like we're in good shape. So we need to strip the material path that the pyro post-process node applies to apply the look. Um, and then render before we visualize it that way. We'll go into this. What camera are we in here? We're doing camera seven for the look dev. I just made a separate camera to zoom in on the vehicle. Um, I think we. Some more scattering. I don't know, it might, it's possible this is just behaving a lot differently with HDR than it would with a spotlight. You know what I mean? Here we go again. All right, let's, uh, let's turn off the dome. We have no lights. And we're going to go back to the spotlight. And uh, I might just go back to the actual kind of shot camera. I think we were doing camera two. Using dome lights for volume contribution. Yeah, it seemed a little bit screwy, right? But I, still, I still think with the vehicle and like environment, it kind of makes sense to the dial stuff in just like what I was saying is if I started to um, do my car shader from this situation, I wouldn't know whether my light is the problem or if my shaders were the problem. That's what I was meaning when I said just to do a standardized 
whether it's your own look dev studio or, or something like that is right now I can kind of tell like it's probably my light it's blowing everything out but if you're working the other way like I've done it before and it you can just make shaders that are really poor because you're like compensating for a, a bad light essentially I think that's looking a little bit better um, and then this volume I just got it way too bright there it is we fixed some stuff I think I whoops not that one um, I was trying to get the shadows back a little bit I don't know this light um, I'm gonna turn that display off um, I might just go to the look through we might want to get a little bit more stepped away and that's cool and dramatic and shit <laughs> yeah so I mean that's that's just the point of like doing the look dev at that other environment especially if you're trying to rim light stuff and do like glancing angles it's really easy to start to get if you're like trying to set up shaders with just a rim light you can get really wonky values or whatever so just take a step back and like work at some unit values or something and, and uh it's, it's if you're working quickly it's you can forget to do it but uh, it makes a, a pretty big difference i'm just gonna pull my light back so it's um more of a uniform in intensity everywhere like it was looking pretty cool right here just the angle it's hitting but i don't really want it like burning out at the top of uh that smoke cloud like i want it to be it kind of breaks the scale of your scene if your light is really close and it's not like a, a studio that you're like the, if you're doing human portraits people usually light it that way but for an exterior scene it doesn't make a lot of sense um, I think I was going. I might switch this to exposure. Like working in stops this way can be a little bit easier instead of. I was always typing in. You just have to make like really big number adjustments because this intensity is just a linear scale. The exposure is more of like an exponential um, shift, but the these numbers are actual like camera stops. So if you're a photographer or you're showing it to the client and they say like you're overexposed by one stop, you can use this exposure to address that change. So, I don't know if this spotlight kind of thing is it's hitting right. <clears throat> it's, a weird, it's a bit weird having it at the top of the frame like that. I guess if we do, Increase that angle, we can just get it more subtle. Look at that. It's a mystery. I feel like it's nice to have it punched in a little bit more kind of moody. I don't know if we want to start adding some other lights to like break it up so it's not as just a one one light source is kind of boring. Um, I'm just gonna go. Blue and pink lights. You want to go into the... Which, oh, that's the bisexual or transsexual lighting.
right? With the cyberpunk. And then this one has a bit of, uh, it's more pastel, right? I don't even know if they have, uh, I don't, I don't know if I can, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna eat myself here. <laughs> um, I think so. It's just the same color as the flag, right? Yeah. So I think this is okay. Um, but yeah, it's just the yeet myself, <laughs> the last, so this, this is where the, those color charts are derived from is like they have flags, uh, representing their, uh, I don't know, different spectrums of the LGBTQIAP plus asterisk, uh, <laughs> Greek letter alphabet, uh, other characters. <laughs> Um, but that's just based off of the flag color. That's why people, um, gave that term to cyberpunk or whatever, because it's like, if you use the flag as the, the new Intel CPU model, <laughs> it's the, uh, um, coffee lake LGBTQ. But yeah, that's that's why it comes from there. I might stick with this for right now. Um, we might add hints of those. So there's a few other things on our list, and we might even, maybe even just try a few different moods or like charts or, or, or examples. But um, so I still have this thing here got a bit strong. It might be my roughness. Um, I think the light is just a bit bright, so I can basically know that it's not my car shader and it's an issue with the light. This is, this is all the, um, that's why I was spending so much time talking about that or working at a expected scene. Um, but yeah, so we have a few things on our list. The, so this is where things were at the start of today. Um, Got a lot better with with different areas. Um, so I think we have a few other, we have a lot of items on our list. We have the wetness we wanna add to the asphalt. Um, this thing is just one or two seconds to render. <laughs> um, the settings were way down and this is a four, 480 by 200 thing. Um, I was just trying to get a preview or results really quick. Um, but yeah, we could try another little thing. Uh, it's, it's in the specs, I think, or it's in the things, but it's, a um, maybe I don't have that yet. Is it the Twitch panel? If you go to the about me page, you can see it. I think it's the RTX 8000. It's a fancy, fancy one, but it's, if you had a like four GPU rig, it would probably be faster than what I was using. It didn't work. I, th I think I need to add it to the bot. Um, but yeah, we might go back up with this. And uh, <laughs> this is the fill-in substitute bot. Um, and, and then uh, we can just reduce that to get more noise kind of resolved. The test frames I was rendering was just before the stream uh, today. Yeah, the VRAM is the biggest uh, in importance of this stuff. Um, but yeah, I was working on some other stuff, so I didn't want to tie up my GPU. But uh, I should do some... Uh, the other results I wasn't weren't super happy with as well, but I think now we could start doing some kind of proper incremental um, renders and just see see what kind of results we get. Um, right before I do this, I'm going to go back to the, the classic asphalt and just make some changements 
for ad adjustments. Um, something about this IOR stuff wasn't, or, or uh, specularity and everything wasn't feeling that good. <laughs> I, I was getting ready to do like a preview render in this stuff was just catching my eye a little bit too much. Um, so I think the Quadro that I have, if you compare it with specs, it's like, might be on par with the 2080 Ti or a little bit faster than um, that just in terms of redshift speed. But the main reason I got it was for OpenCL for the VRAM amount because you can, you can't share GPU memory with the, the that stuff. Um, so I wanted it to be uh, big enough to fit large simulation containers and stuff in. That Hopefully that makes some sense. I think my bump was just a little bit too, too absurd before. Um, <laughs> this has got to go fast. It's more about just having the knowledge or the um, peace of mind that your simulation isn't going to crap out or or uh, if you like as soon as you hit that memory limit you your your entire results are trash because it just is like a failure um, so it's just for me it's easier to it's the same prices not this car but a car um, but yeah it's if you're doing client work and stuff like that like it's nice to be able to just make your domain bigger if you have a sim, a, 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 a seam, or hitting the edge of your container or whatever. Um, side effects has stuff dialed in where you get the results are very close. Like you probably don't get the exact same results because the noise functions and stuff like that give you a little bit different values. But just in terms of broad settings, like you should be able to move between them, but I'm not even really doing CPU simulations right now because it's too slow. Like this simulation, I was able to do it in under an hour. Um, so just working on, on things, I don't like to wait a day or two days to... I know some people doing CPU simulations, like especially with Puma FX, some people would just let a simulation go for an entire week and that would be like how, how quickly they worked, but it was insane to... <laughs> To do that is like very nerve-wracking. It's just like I have to wait a week to see if my my results turned out well. Um, I don't know. I might. I'm just gonna do a color correct here. Um, and wanted to. I, think, I don't know if this color is coming kind of from my light or something like that. I guess right now the majority of everything is um, coming from the spec. So I might go with it a little bit more uh, reflective. All right. So I think we're good to make a quick uh, and see how quick we could do like a test render. Um, someone yesterday suggested my streams. Thank you. It's good to <laughs> thank them for, for bringing you here. Yeah, so these streams are a little bit, um, this is pretty nice. 
Um, yeah, and then th there was one guy like Jesus Suarez. Um, I think he uses Octane, but he has a really nice tutorial series and uh, he does really nice studio setups for autom automotive shaders and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully you find these CG Rockstar, hopefully you find these useful, like they do get pretty advanced pretty quickly with the streams. Um, with the YouTube, I did one like a grain crumbling character and those are meant to be very gentle, slower introductions, but this stuff can get somewhat advanced pretty quickly, but hopefully it doesn't. Uh... Oh, you're an automotive specialist. Hopefully you might know more, more about this stuff than I do. I've butchered uh, the namings of, of these calipers and, and stuff like that. Doing a full CGI car crash series. Who's doing that? It's with, um, there's one, there's this one like steam thing. Um, I think it's, it has like NG in the title or something like that. Um, but it's supposed to have really like a cinematic beam NG. This one is supposed to give you really interesting physics. Cinematic. Like editing kind of. But um I was always interested in this because like I, I was wondering if you could export <clears throat> um FBX. It, it, it seems Windows only, so I wasn't really able to test it that much. But I think that you can like export some some files and stuff. Um, oh, cool. You were doing, that's a big thing to bite off. Is CG car crashes, depending on it, is pretty difficult. Um, with this. I had worked at uh, Atomic Fiction when they were working on this car crash thing here, and it was pretty, uh, pretty fun. To work on, I was just doing some some debris and stuff like that. Um, they actually did a lot of the car uh, rolling and flipping and stuff like that with traditional animators because the art director and stuff really wanted to design stuff to match like and not rely on simulations that are a little less predictable. Oh, it's one of your references. Um, but yeah, I was just doing some some supplementary effects and stuff like that um, at the time. It's, Houdini didn't have as many tools like FEM was just being introduced and the, the cloth solver was an older thing but I think you could get a lot more um, of these physics and stuff like that with the um, vellum stuff or like vellum I think you can get some really nice metal crumpling and stiffness and things like that um, but yeah I might I need to do more research. Yeah, for metal denting and like the the pieces flying off and, and stuff like that. Um, I think doing doing vellum to get the especially like the plastic deformation where it will get like hit and then hold the shape after it's been impacted or whatever. Um, like some of this stuff when it starts really uh, bouncing and, and rolling, like it just keeps getting more and more destroyed. All this stuff was like modeling and just done per shot. Um, this is just the approach that the, the supervisors and stuff wanted. But yeah, it should be. Um... Oh, nice. Getting really good uh, shaders set up here. I've gone in just like an amateur today. You have RBD hard constraints. Yeah, those are pretty pretty good too. Um, you, I, I'm not connected to your <laughs> your uh, hard drive. I'm, I'm not hacking yet. Um, but let me. Uh, I was just about to. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, I was just about to send this to get this rendering, but we could keep talking in a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Oh, I'm excited to see the rain system. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get start tackling some some asphalt wetness here 
in a little bit. So this thing, I think I have my um, photographic exposure. I don't know how this, it didn't look like it was burning out that, that much before. Um, but I'm just gonna see how long this frame takes and then I think I can render it in the background. Uh, so yeah, I don't know what happens. Move the light back. Yeah, I'm not sure. I just didn't, I wasn't noticing it earlier. I don't know if it was my, just the noise settings and stuff like that. Um, it's just more, more uh, disconcerting <laughs> than it is. I'm a bit puzzled as to how it happened. Um, but yeah, I might take the light The smoke's looking good, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm got stuck here. <laughs> um, I don't know what the hell is going on. Um, but yeah, I was just hoping to get a quick. This this should be okay. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna change these settings. Something very. Somewhat low quality, um, maybe half resolution. Um, trying to get just very quick kind of turnarounds and stuff like that. Um, I think I can do it with this HQ stuff. I don't really do Houdini training. Um, I was doing some at an actual university as like a on-site professor. But um, I haven't done any remote stuff. I don't. I'm not really set up to do any of that uh, stuff, especially right now with just time. I don't have a lot of free time to do uh, like one-on-one -on -one stuff, unfortunately. Something I might do in the future, or some workshops or a boot camp or something like that. But just with with everything right now, it's it would be too much for me to to try to take on. Um. So I'm trying to get this going. With this HQ stuff. Um, so it will render here maybe pretty quickly. We'll see how long these frames take. Uh, so I just wanted to, sorry, I just wanted to get that going before I really uh, went in more with this stuff. Um, as far as uh, recommendations for good Houdini training, um, some people have been passing stuff around in, in the uh, Discord, like somewhat entry level um, learning techniques and stuff. There's like a, a Google Doc, I think that uh, Christopher Rutledge had, had shared. Um, I think that's floating around in, in the Discord somewhere. Um, but yeah, this, this is looking pretty nice. I like how you've, uh, color coded the different, like, um, states of, of the particles, like spraying or, or bouncing, splashing, condensation ones and, and stuff like that. Steven Nipping for VFX. Yeah, Steven, he has really good, uh, I think it's on CG circuit. Um, with, yeah, it's, it's really important to see how things are working because you're kind of like debugging systems. Um, so you need to know like the different logic and stuff like that. Um, in terms of, do I need, what else is in this thing? I think we're okay with that for now. Um, I don't use shotgun, <laughs> shoot gun. Uh, I'm just still using RV. I'm trying to switch over to Mr. Viewer. RV is really pog, yeah. It's uh, definitely the best viewer ever 
I've ever used. Um, just being able to like flip flop, try out different uh, mirroring, like there's just, you have every control you need at, the, at your fingertips. Um, doing the annotations um, for like the client's uh, notes. It's pretty nice as well. Uh, it's, it's super nice. I think Mr. Viewer is like the open source alternative. I, I still need to look into do that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I'm not sure with the cache viewer. Um, it looks like my frames are going pretty quick. The initial test I was doing was just two, two seconds a frame. Um, so now these are going at kind of 10, 14 seconds or something like that. Uh, it's RV, the Autodesk will make the, that, um, that viewer. It's really useful for, for making notes or reviewing things or anything kind of like that. Um, yeah, so I think I can just grab the path from here and take a look at the frames. Get rid of that. So maybe the frames will start going slower once once the smoke comes up a little bit more. Yeah, you can annotate, and um, there's ways to save the session, or you can do you can even like sync these sessions with the client and do stuff like that. But basically, if you make an annotation on one frame, it will stay on that frame. So if you you can even do like stop motion kind of stuff if you're doing uh, an explosion, you want like certain marks or certain stuff happening on, on certain frames it's it's really cool for that stuff more expensive than houdini indie yeah it was originally tweak was developing this a uh, different company and then autodesk bought it i don't know if it comes with a student like when i was teaching at the the academy of art university in san francisco here they had um with their shotgun licensing they had a bunch of rv licenses uh that the students could use and stuff like that yeah, it's, it's pretty nice. Um, as far as the um, rain stuff, like I think, I don't know if you've seen it, but this blue umbrella stuff that Pixar did, there might be talks and everything online. Um, like I've talked about that Piper um, sand system earlier. So Pixar did a similar really deep dive. I don't know if they released it anywhere. I saw it, it was like a SIGGRAPH um, presentation. It might be on Vimeo or something like that. Um, whoops. But they had like, yeah, I'm using Linux. Um, they had, might be in some of this stuff i don't know but they did very very um specific shaders and methods for rendering the, the rain on a per shot basis like the way that you see the drops um from certain angles they were doing sometimes rendering them as like tubes that were orient facing the camera with some noise running along them um when they had some macro shots of like this like it was just so it's so interesting to see all the detail and everything that they put into it. Um, any 3D can be way faster on Linux. Yeah, I think it's just, it's also easier to, they might've done a new one for Toy Story with the rain. There was just a particular presentation that I remember seeing that I found really, um, useful but i don't know if it's like still online or anything like that but yeah it seems like linux is just easier to manage um your memory and uh everything like that like to, to make sure things don't crash or to make sure that things don't uh happen like that yes in twc how's it going 
I'm I'm no master. Yeah, the just the Pixar. I mean, it's it depends because they're doing a stylized kind of uh, result that they're after, so they want it to look a little bit less um, realistic. It looks like we're getting a little bit of uh, smoke happening here. Master for you, <laughs> Emperor. No. Um, but yeah, it's, I think the spec, I don't know if we, on that car shader, we might just need to bring it down a little bit. Um, it does look like we're, we might need to get a little bit closer to Basta's, uh, color measurement that he made. This is feeling a little bit too, too red or too, uh, too orange. We're just going to see how things look. Um, I don't know if we'll get to it today. We might have to wait until next time. But our next steps are the details. Um, headlights, taillights, brake lights, if maybe animate them when he's stopping. Um, some, some different materials on the ground. We're going to do a procedural uh, wetness kind of shader and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it seems like this, um, it seems like some of this, uh, rain stuff, like it's very specific on environment conditions and stuff like that. Like this kind of stuff, you might even want to do it with a volume. You might even do it with like a procedural volume or something like that. You could use particles from thinking particles or standard max particles to drive the birth of density. Yeah, I've seen some really good um, 3ds Max setups for doing wind from like sand dunes and stuff like that. And uh, I don't know if it's thinking particles or it was the P flow stuff, but it seems like 3ds Max has some good tools for, for setting that stuff up. Um, not pyro. Yeah, I think this kind of stuff is just really about um, the the end result. Like even this, you don't really see a lot of dynamics. Like it, that's why I'm saying it could be the procedural noise stuff. Um, there was this stream I did a while back for the fog layer. Houdini, using Houdini should be going with Pyro, right? And Pop Network. It depends on the approach. Um, I mean, there's not one, it depends like what you're comfortable with or what you want to be learning and stuff like that. Like all of those things are just tools that you have at your disposal to, to know what's best, but it's kind of just takes a lot of time and experience and stuff like that as, as an effects artist to, to look at things and then know which steps or which uh, approaches to, to take to accomplish it. Um, but yeah, this kind of stuff, you might be able to get away with like just particles. Um, the reasons people might go that route is because if you're just using particles, you can get results, uh, within an hour and maybe renders with like, I'll do an iteration within an hour and see what it looks like and make changes that you need. Um, if you're doing pyro, you like, depending on your resources, it might take you an entire day to do the simulation. Um, and then you're just not, you don't have as much control over the end result. So that's why people would use these other approaches that would either be particles or the procedural approach would be the most straightforward because you're not even doing a simulation. You would just kind of be doing like a 3D noise that's offset in a direction with some animation of the uh, fourth component or the evolving. Um, so then that's just more closer to working like a game engine. Like if you ever look at the atmospherics and stuff in it, they're, they always look pretty good just because the people can, the artists can dial stuff in. Like they change a slider and immediately see what, what, what uh, change they did and how it looks. Um, so it's just very much up to the artists and how, what tools they're comfortable with. Yeah, it's like volumetric clouds kind of. Um, so even with Houdini, they did do there's like a pretty famous, I don't know if it's famous, but um, it was popular at the time that was like on real time clouds. Uh, 
Um, and they, in the tutorial, they show you how to bring them into Unreal, but I don't know if you need to do that whole step. But this kind of stuff here, um, you could imagine, like just instead of having the camera fly through it, if you just shift it over across the ground or animate it. Um, I don't know where that, like if you just animate this stuff, uh, sliding across the camera, it, depending, you tweak the, the density or the opacity, it should start to kind of look, yeah, just moving quick, very quickly. Um, so I think in this, like he creates basically sprites out of these, um, doing opacity, and then this is the Unreal Shader Editor or whatever. It's pretty similar to Bops or making like Redshift shaders or that kind of stuff. Um, so he's baking the lighting information and some stuff like that to the particles, but um, the end result, like, because it's so so transparent, like, you it doesn't really catch shadows. You don't need to have that much lighting information. It's, it's almost just like a constant uh, fog. Like, I mean, not not a constant fog visually, but like the shader is just not really applying lighting too much, but it's just blocking some of the light as the uh, as you move through it. So if you just offset this kind of stuff, like there's the um, there's some of the one of the older streams that I was kind of doing some stuff like that. Um, I don't know this. My uh, YouTube is <laughs> user interface for it is really bad. Um, yeah. Where did it go? Yeah, so this one was an older one that I did. Um, I, I did, I think, do some horizontal, showing some horizontal offsets and stuff like that. Um, if you just look through that, that's the procedural. I mean, it, it depends a lot on like the needs of the look of the shot and the art director and all that stuff was like what people want in the end result, but, and your, just your skill with working with Vex or procedural noises and, and stuff like that. We started to get a little smoke, <laughs> so I think it's getting a little slower as uh, it has to render the volume. Um, and then the other, yeah, it just looks like it's getting a little bit slower when it starts to get to the volume rendering. Yeah, it's Redshift and then I'm using I'm, I'm not, I, I don't have that much equipment, but it's two different computers. Um, one just has a GTX 1070, I think. And then one has this card that I'm using. Yeah, well, I mean, yours looked a lot better. Like you, <laughs> I, I turned my noise settings up like quite, like you, you could see a ton of noise. I'm, I'm rendering at a lower resolution and stuff like that. But because this is the stream, um, I don't want to keep people waiting to, to see the results or whatever. Um, and then just balancing other stuff to work on and, and stuff like that. Um, I don't want to... Yeah, V-Ray CPU, I could see it being a little slower. Yeah, so it's a bit odd right now. I don't know if, um, I guess I wasn't able to do a ton of look dev um, with the dome light applied to the smoke. So I'm thinking I don't really need to change car shader stuff too much. I might do some color changes. Um, it is looking a little warm for whatever reason. Um, but I think my smoke needs to become brighter and then my light K 
can become um, a little dimmer and uh, we can kind of bounce stuff out a little bit more that way. I don't know if anyone has any um, other observations. It might be nice to get... I don't really know... Does it use the GPU on the render node while rendering Redshift, or is it CPU? Oh, it's a GPU. So it's just another workstation. It was my older workstation. Um, I don't know if any of this information is useful. Um, it doesn't give you the GPU in, in this view. I think I have to go into the uh, logs to see it. Um, I don't, but yeah, it just says one GPU. Uh, so it's a GTX 1070 on that machine. Yes, there's some, some HDRIs I might use, um, on that resources thing. Uh, I think some of these, I think this Kung Fu one, they might've had backplates. But um, the main reference I had was the V-Ray. Um, I don't know where, I don't remember what I typed in to find it. Um, but there's like a V-Ray marketing one that I was kind of trying to somewhat simulate. I don't want to match it perfectly. Um, so yeah, I was thinking eventually of adding some park, like this is meant to be a parking lot that this car is, is in. Um, so on, kind of on our general list of things is uh, per perhaps some white lines or yellow lines like road markings, um, dampness, like just maybe even tire marks, um, some dampness on the ground to get some, some more interesting highlights. I don't know this camera angle is a little bit odd as well. Um, and then some headlight stuff from the vehicle. Yeah, it's a racetrack that he's on. Um, I mean, it's I'm not 100% trying to match every aspect of it, but just certain qualities and, and mood and stuff like that of the uh, of that environment. So for right now, I think we're okay going off into darkness. Um, I think the next, some of the next steps are doing um, headlight, taillights, dampness in the ground. And then at that step would be when we would want to start building out more of the environment with uh, additional, I'm just thinking right now, like, even here, this, this stuff never goes to black. So maybe uh, getting our main light a little bit. I guess this, this highlight is coming from the stadium lights. But yeah, it's a, it's a puzzle. <laughs> we'll, we'll see where we end up. Even doing something like this could be uh, somewhat interesting. I'm not 100% bound to a, a certain um, environment or whatever, and like a, a backplate would definitely help out a bit. Yeah, I mean, even doing some some shots like this, like a cut of a, I, I would just feel like my camera is a bit wonky, why it's, how it's so high up and tilted down like that. Um, but like, one of these shots with a camera closer to the ground probably would uh, would be working better too. I guess this is pretty cool too, just to make kind of a pattern or a abstract like kind of lattice or something with the background. But yeah, we're just chipping away slowly. HDRLs. Yeah, sometimes I use some HDRI, um, like a box, soft box, or, or stuff like that for um, 
the lights. I've never, I don't know the specific, but I can imagine, I can imagine there's specific like values and stuff for, for studio lighting. So yeah, I don't know if this, uh, I think my, I don't know if my density, once I get some more highlights in the smoke, it is just overall a bit flat. These, these renders are uh, going slower than I expected. Yeah, the smoke's a bit flat. Like, I think what happened was, uh, it, my adjustments of it, like, got, it's too decoupled right now from the rest, the rest of the stuff that's behaving more as expectedly with the, the spotlight that I put in. Um, so, I don't know if we want to let the, the render stuff keep going. Um, yeah. So I, th I think we could make some of these quick changes. Um, trying to find my HQ window to get rid of this stuff. Um, so yeah, I think what we can do, go somewhere, oops, didn't want to click that one. Um, there it is. The interactive render um yes yeah, so i think the the overall light just became too bright um we go back to i don't know even even uh this i guess this makes a little bit more sense um so just bring the, the overall light down one stop and then going into our smoke and bringing it up there, it's gonna be way too much. So, something like this, and then the shadows. We'd just been adjusting this before in, um, in unbalanced, like we didn't have anything else to compare it to, but now that we have the vehicle. Um, yeah, the car color is, is a bit too orange. I don't know if this, I think I was just missing a lot of uh, shadow detail and stuff. One of the things I was playing with, with with this absorption ramp was like bringing it down so that the shadows just get a lot crunchier as the light uh, moves through it or as the, the values in the the stuff change. Um, would be nice if they had the phase to do like forward or, or backward scattering or whatever. I think this is kind of okay. Yeah, so let's let's hit this car color. Just have to go into the object, kind of just keeping everything in one place there. Um, yeah, so this was Basta's reference, and then ours, I think just because that's um, probably a bit too much, but I think just because the um, HDR that we were using was like outdoors, it was a little contaminated with too much green, so I compensated with that and sucked out a lot of green when I set this one up. I don't know, something like this is starting to, to seem a little bit better. Um, I'm a little curious with some of this stuff.
I don't have any, I'm not using the HDR right now. I think the HDRI stuff isn't um, playing well with the smoke with Redshift. Um, so I think my like base um, specular was a bit too sharp before. I don't know if this trying to make it a little bit rougher and I just disabled the um Yeah, so I was just doing that right now. Um Yeah, I don't know with the base IOR you want to be a bit closer to um like a somewhat somewhat close to a rubber or something. Maybe that was uh That was it. I'm a little hesitant to make too many tweaks with because we're just still in the very odd lighting territory and stuff like that. Um and then I might kind of go in and Maybe just do another light and see what, what happens right now. Yeah, so my roughness was, I think I'm at like 0.5, somewhere around there right now. Um, I don't know if I need more of it or not, but you can kind of see the coat. That's the only place you can see the coat, just the perfectly clean mirror. Um, gonna go in with uh, another light right now. So this one's just set to area. Might need to refresh to uh, have it pulled in. Use curves for the uh, IOR. So I have this other light coming in. Um, I think it's kind of helping everyone with that. I think it's helping a little bit, just we were in a little bit too much like 1980s <laughs> territory with our single spotlight is a bit uh, basic. I think maybe having something here um, giving some, some specular interest to the back, pretty nice. Um, I might go back to the main light. I, I, I think I'm gonna move it so it's not as much of a glancing angle. Um, I think early on with the smoke, it looked really nice, but then with the, re the rest of uh, the objects and stuff, it's just a little bit too, too bizarre just kind of an unrealistic thing to see a light glancing at, at the vehicle kind of like that um like this it's not as exciting of a render but it's just more i don't know physically plausible i guess let's try a different frame, see what happens with the smoke. Might have gone too, too bright with it. That's, I don't know, it's hard to know this, it feels a little bit more balanced. My, it feels a little bit too too bright right now, but I'm gonna leave it there. 
So this is kind of what I was trying to do. I don't know how easy it is to see here with this shadow stuff. You can like use it to control how much light is getting blocked or let in just at different voxel values or different areas of the uh, of the smoke. Then if you go like higher numbers with this, you, you can use it. Yeah, I, haven't, I didn't do any shading inside of the car. It's just uh, it's a pretty bad shader that's being used in there right now. Um, but yeah, I think I'm gonna I'm planning to add some highlights or headlights and uh, maybe just having something happening inside of it or just cheating it like with a. <laughs> A picture, a, a constant shader, or something like that. Um, you might want to. It's a little weird right now. It just doesn't look like there's any reflection on that glass. You might need to look into that. Um, the smoke is doing a little bit better now. We get a picture of Kim doing donuts. It's like the Walter White uh, Breaking Bad scene when he. <laughs> Gets the really expensive car and just trashes it in the parking lot. Um, yeah, so this vehicle... Let's take a look at this glass stuff. Um, just try turning off refraction. It looks like we get the mirror that way. Um, I don't know if it's... Put the headlights to 1.1. Isn't one just air? Or you said you're saying to just put it to one. Um, so you get reflections on the glass of the highlight. See through the interior details. Yeah, I need to do some customizations with this, the headlights and. Uh, and tail lights and, and stuff to get them. I'm more concerned about this stuff because this is like more of the broad strokes. So I might just reduce this refraction to kind of imply like a tint or something is happening. I think that's a little bit is an illegal tint. <laughs> Everything he's doing is illegal right now. Um, yeah, the distortions are never... Clients are never happy with physically <laughs> accurate distortions. But yeah, I think that's a little bit... I'm going to leave it just so you can see a little bit through certain areas, maybe. So it's not a complete mirror. It just makes things maybe it's still a little bit intriguing. Um, let's try another frame. The highlights, they're a little bit, uh, it's a, it's a, it is an issue, I think. More smaller lights, yeah. Yeah, maybe those parking lots, overhead lights or something. Um, I think the the um, car body. I was, I'm a little hesitant to like mess with my shader too much, but um, I think just making this base a little bit more rough. Yeah, there's some references I was looking at um, in a few different places, but it, it, it is a good point to go look at some, some references and stuff.
this is a I feel like this is a little bit better um not that's I don't want to go too too wild with it um yeah there's uh, behance is a lot of uh top tier references and stuff as you get insane quality of uh, of talent there um so i'm just gonna take this light and uh try to do something else with it just to get um still some more kind of interest or something happening i've i've never used pure ref is that a that's a different application It's an Adobe thing. I'm just going to, whoops, I'm just going to fill these other lights for a second and uh, just kind of solo this one, see what's going on. Oh, I, I, I think I see what happened. These other lights I added aren't getting um, the zero dollars. <laughs> so I think the volume contribution, I, I forgot to add that with the new lights that I added. So that's what uh, one of the things that was messing everything up a little bit. So it looks like my smoke got messed up again now because of that. GTA. <laughs> so I need to go back in here and, and put that one back down. Yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. It's um, I'm always looking for better, better reference management utilities and stuff like that, or even sources. Um, but yeah, I'm I think I'm getting close to, to wrapping it up. Um, I'm just gonna do a few more changes here, and then uh, probably gonna be gonna be it for today or for right now. Um, Maybe this stuff was getting it uh, a little bit too much extra lights and stuff like that. Um, I think it's a little bit better. I don't know. We solved like the burnout highlight and stuff. Um, and that type of area, VFX CGI augmented reality. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, I'm, I'm interested to examine it. Yeah, it's a little heavy heavy-handed yeah the back part is looking a bit a bit uh, crunchy it's a little it's more like a, a gas exhaust or something like that what's that mess that is is that Houdini just the Ken Blocks. Yeah, the Ken Black stuff we were looking at um, a few days ago. That's pretty good reference. So maybe this is uh, just a little more natural for the, the smoke stuff. I was also playing around with this shadow scale.
It's a little unrealistic to boost it, but it's sometimes it's nice to um, just add, bring in some more detail and stuff like that from the the smoke simulation. Yeah, Houdini is a it's a it's a tough entry point for a lot of people. When I was in uh, college, I was in the 3D program for several years, and I had, still hadn't even heard of Houdini till like my senior year. It's a a very um, messy. <laughs> this is a very confusing application to pick up, I think. Um, so I might just see what happens with these new values. Um, I don't know how how far. We might be able to just go into the exciting area of the scene. Maybe start at like frame 120 and uh, just launch a render to the farm starting later on into the, the scene and see what happens. Smoke lighting is, is lighting it up a bit too much. Yeah, I'm kind of uh, just broadly using that V-Ray. Um, where did it go? This is kind of just like a rough style guide, just a thing to match kind of moody or dark or whatever. Um, is there a way to display wind direction with a helper? Uh, I, I don't think it's as easy as it is in, in 3ds max like the glow you don't have the global gizmos and stuff um they used to have it with some of the older pop workflows and stuff um some of the some of the things like that but um i think with some of the new pop nodes it's a little bit let me just make sure my my renders are, are moving along. Um, so yeah, I just set this to go directly into the smoke area. Um, tie the rotation of the helper to force direction. So this is going to switch over to our new lighting stuff. So we brightened out a lot of the lights. Kind of a step closer, but it's we might have gone a bit too flat now with uh, with some of the stuff. The smoke is, is definitely looking better. Let it go for a little bit. Yeah, it's a custom splash screen. I, I just rotate them through different things. Um, it just gets boring to look at the, the default one all the time and stuff with it. Um, so like if you use the DopNet, they used to have these gravity and um, wind and stuff like that, but these aren't really used that much anymore. Um, like this, this was more of a 3ds Max workflow and stuff because it was, um, uh, I don't know, I just, I did the animation very quickly and figured it was like he's driving in, stopping, and then he's just doing donuts in place, like a demonstration, kind of. Um, yeah, the animation could probably be a bit better. Um, so yeah, if you do your, your forces this way, I think like then you, you would get some handles and stuff like that, that would change the direction of, of things. Um, but these don't apply that well with the pop stuff. So, um, if you just have like a grid up network, you just have some, some stuff spraying up. Um, yeah, I mean, they have the, the wind force and pop force and stuff like that. Um, but I think those aren't as easy to like, you can turn on guide up there. Um, it looks like it, nothing, there's no handle or anything like that. Yeah, I think with the turbulence. Okay. Yeah. So this is, guide is to visualize the scale of the turbulence. Um, so this noise is like a curl noise and then using that guide, you you can visualize the scale of it. Um, and I guess once you start to, uh, move these numbers 
it will show you the, the global direction. Um, I don't think that there's an easy way to to um, tr translate transform this using a gizmo. Like I think you're just stuck typing in numbers. Um, some of the some of the other nodes like this pop. Yeah, that guide is pretty nice. Um, these ones come with a guide, and this is like using the sphere uh, to to move stuff around. Like you can see, it's just doing the rotation there. So these ones you can actually work more interactively and stuff, and it's it's a bit uh, nice to, to be able to do that. But for whatever reason, the um, yeah, so these ones you. I don't know if the gizmo doesn't maybe this side effects need, needs to update it or something like that. So it should be rotating that primitive shape. Um, but yeah, just historically, I think. Um, so this, that one I just did the pop axis force and it comes with that guide built in. Um, so as long as you're in this, you just have to make sure you're in the handle move this tool at the bottom there. Um, because if I'm in this, I can see the gizmo, but I can't see the handle or move it around or whatever. Uh, so if you click that, then you can do like rotations. It's a little weird how it's not updating. Um, the last one is the pop wind. Um, so this one. I think it's probably just going to be the same as, as the other one. Um, but yeah, they don't give you a global direction thing. Um, the last thing that they did have was like a fan force. I guess they have it with this. Um, so this this one's pretty nice because you can blow stuff around. Like this is more... Um, I don't know if you could... It's just going to go within that cone. Um, but yeah, this this stuff is pretty nice to uh, visually. You can kind of dial, see the the angle of uh, stuff that you're blowing. Um, yeah, in Pyro they have the gas nodes. Like generally, I don't use a lot of like directional. Um, I don't think there's any other shapes. I think it's just a cone. Um, with Pyro. They do have the pyro, like gas wind and stuff, um, but I, I don't tend to use that stuff that often. Um, the gas wind is doing a lot of fancy stuff within VOPS to make it work, so it's really slow to use it with OpenCL. Um, but this one is meant for like kind of artist-friendly wind. Uh, the, what I usually do with the smoke stuff if you do a smoke object um, under um, initial data, you could set wind direction. Um, so this is uh, easy. It's very quick for it to calculate. Um, it's just setting a constant directional wind speed. Uh, and you can break it up with like turbulence. So this turbulence node is just the equivalent of this kind of noise settings and stuff. Um, yeah, you just do control B, so you hold down control and press B on any of the panes and it will, uh, maximize it. <laughs> How do you get floating attributes? Oh, uh, it's just the P button. So you, once you, you have a full screen, full screen thing, uh, it's just P for parameters and that gives you this parameter pane. Um, yeah, so I prefer to do it because if I want to, I can turn it off with P. Um, and I could turn it back on and I can just, as I'm working, kind of move it around to different areas. Uh, some people prefer the, the other like pain of just having a dedicated parameter editor or whatever, but I like this this way. Then you can kind of jump in and like change your network. It requires some hotkeys, but it's just I, I use it and I kind of adapt it as I'm as I'm working. You do a lot of other workspaces, like some people might have the look dev dedicated ones or whatever. Yet, yeah, especially on if you're on a laptop or 
a smaller resolution um, screen. It will just be to, um, you just wanna, that's why I've made these shelf tools up here, just the, the text. Because before they'll take up like twice as much space or whatever, and it will just be a bit um, too much, too much real estate you're, you're using with the, the tools or whatever. So I'm probably going to end this pretty soon. Um, we made some some progress. We got uh, a few steps forward. We we did make shaders for the vehicle. Um, we kind of have all of our stuff now like it's sitting in the same settings world yeah yeah i'll definitely uh keep that in mind for for mentoring or, or anything like that um i don't know about some of this it might be a, just a bit too transparent overall but kind of depends with this tire smoke stuff you as you definitely don't thank you habitow it's uh <laughs> Saji Shushka. <laughs> Thank you for the follow, Enduku. Um, but yeah, we, we, we're making progress. It might might be a bit too... Um, so much new stuff that I start fiddling with myself instead of going to sleep. Saji <laughs> Shukla. That's your name in the Discord? Um, yeah, it's a, with Houdini, it's really easy to get sidetracked and interested in a certain solver or a certain node or something, then you drop everything else you're doing or whatever. Ah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense with the, the first name, last name. Um, but yeah, it's, it's progress. Uh, I'll probably try to, to do a higher, somewhat higher quality um, resolution, like render quality of this settings just so we have a reference point, uh, like a mark and uh, something to compare back to as we continue to make progress. And um, yeah, so this chops off here and these were the, the second round of changes that I made today. Um, it's like, that's the, the hardest part about um, smoke stuff is just that the density values change because there's cooling or it's like expanding or taking up more or less space so like lighting it and shading it is very hard to type in values i guess some of this stuff as it moves around is, is difficult too uh for folding of metals the dynamics i use cloth sims uh you can do it with with cloth sims in houdini they have some metal settings and stuff like that like just with the plasticity or, or stuff like that. Um, this is one, I, I haven't finished watching it, but this tutorial here, um, where it's more of like a presentation, at the end of the, the thing, he, he's giving some really like artist friendly. That means the dress on the right would weigh 100 pounds. Um, so settings or parameters or stuff like that. Um, I think he goes into to getting something. He talks about like leather and the, the, the parameters that you would do to get something a bit more stiff. Um, yeah, it's called vellum. Is the, the I think vellum is like a um, historical name for a piece of hide or like skin of an animal that you would people used to use as paper like a long time ago or something so that, that's why they called it that um yeah you could do that so you could either make the inside really stiff or you could have like a static object and stuff um but yeah i think with this stiffness i guess he doesn't really go into it but basically like plus is leather and then higher you get even further and then bend you would want to go even higher than plastic to get uh, a metal type of um, response to it there's a, i'm sure there's some forum threads or stuff if you look around a little bit yeah i think you can paint parameters um you might you might not be able to directly paint them on the constraints but you might like if you just paint on your geometry and then do an attribute transfer or something, you should be all set. 
but yeah all this cloth stuff is designed to be pretty artist friendly so it's even that's why they even made these nodes so you can work with it without even going into dynamics um but yeah character effects artists they'll definitely paint and sculpt the the materials of their um garment simulations and stuff like that so yeah let's do um one more reload of our cat of our uh frames and just set our in and out points so the this sim of the smoke and stuff is pretty good the lighting the the area i'm not as good at is uh definitely lacking still um but yeah i think i think this is yeah the motion's pretty nice i, I do like certain areas where the car whiffs like changes a bunch of the the influence and stuff like that yeah i think the lighting needs the most work i'm feeling a little bit better just about the shading the shader for the smoke um it might it might be nice to be a little like thicker in some areas um but yeah i think we're getting closer to the to an area where like the, the sims working the shaders are starting to work this is a little questionable in some areas but lighting and stuff like that is now um is now the big concern yeah i, I didn't do a lot of research in in terms of this the stuff like that um there was like one ken block reference that i was looking at where smoke was just coming out of all the different areas of the car like even underneath there was like extra pipes shooting stuff out um the arches top part should have the smoke coming out yet yeah, i'm not too concerned about it being physically precise and then um when i was simulating it i talked a little bit about it but with the um collision geometry and stuff like that like you're never really going to have enough resolution to simulate like the airflow and um pipes like the that underneath and everything so it's always a bit questionable with that kind of stuff um the sim takes about an hour a half hour or something to run but it, did, it took me a couple of days to dial in and set up and stuff like that um but yeah i'm just doing it on the the gpu with opencl and it takes about an hour or so to to cash out Uh, it's a, it's a four. No, it's just a single CPU. Yeah, it's it's not that good of a CPU. It's not the sparse volume. This is the older method. Uh, so for doing a GPU OpenCL simulation, you're still kind of stuck using the older uh, Pyro solver. But yeah, this moment here when it completes the arc is pretty cool. Um, so the times eight is the number of of cores essentially like so that's why i did eight times because it's eight cores or eight uh threads or whatever that are at uh that gigahertz yeah i just kind of copied and pasted the the settings or whatever from here yeah maybe 16 um threads i i'm not I, I always get confused with that kind of stuff um but yeah my cpu isn't that good i didn't spend a lot of money if i was to build another workstation i'd probably go over to the thread ripper for the cpu stuff um I'm, I've, i haven't been too happy with this xeon one but i, I use opencl or gpu for red drain and most of the simulations so it's just sop cooks like a lot of the VDB operations that are CPU intensive get pretty slow. But yeah, this is uh, coming along. We'll be back on Wednesday. Um, doing hopefully less tweaks and more progress. Uh, and we'll be moving into some more advanced kind of environment stuff. Um, 
Yeah, the third third ripper quadro combination would be ideal, I think. I was reading some articles that like um for redshift like IO you want just low core count but really high uh speed. But it's I don't know. It depends with Houdini, it's just so many different areas of it get used use your your equipment with for different things. Um but yeah, we'll be back on Wednesday, making some wet wetness on the shader, adding some lights, improving this kind of stuff, um, making just overall, hopefully, better vibes, better uh, mood setting and stuff like that, and uh, maybe some lines for doing a parking lot and stuff. Um, this was just to, yeah, so this stuff here was like, some of my other references. So maybe just getting the camera up higher or something, um, some stuff like that. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's in the schedule uh, thing. So the Wednesday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday are the days all at 1 p.m. Pacific. Um, every day is usually kind of a working session. Some are more lecture based than others. Um, and then Friday is just the cool zone work like freeform, rough draft, con more concept art kind of workflow or whatever. Yeah, thanks for your uh, your measurements of the the uh, color paint bust. We did we did end up going back to them. I don't know if you were you were away for a little bit, but we did end up with a, our stuff a little bit too too orange. Um, so it was helpful to have those numbers. So yeah, thanks everyone for hanging out. Uh, helping me stumble. <laughs> we, we avoided some of the bigger problems this time today. We're making progress. We'll be back Wednesday. Thanks again for, for taking all the time and hanging out.